Uh, this episode of the CMO Suite is brought to you by Connectivity Strategies, specializing in micro-targeted full-funnel media strategies for clients like WWE, Corona, First Watch, Coke, and more. Connectivity Strategy, national strength, localized approach. Visit them at connectivitystrategy.com and to me. Product quality and selection are key attributes that have made Toomey the leading international business accessory and travel lifestyle brand. Simply put, there is no other product made like Toomey. That is what they call the Toomey difference. And finally, No Kid Hungry. We're incredibly proud that we make a contribution in the name of each of our 2019 guests to No Kid Hungry. Your tax-deductible donation will help us provide vulnerable kids in America with nutritious meals so they can focus on being kids, not being hungry. For more information, visit nokidhungry.org. Let's start the show. You're in the CMO Suite, the podcast for marketers who want to be in the know, presented by Connectivity Holdings. Hello and welcome to the start of the show. I am your host, Sean Halter. Welcome to the CMO Suite. And with me producing and co-hosting today is my great friend, Holly Paper. I'm super proud to uh, introduce our guest on the show, a global product creative for Netflix. It's Carl Gibson. Hi, Carl. Hi. Thank you for having me. Carl, uh, so talk to us. First of all, thanks for, for joining us on the show. Thank you. How far are you from, he- from here, uh, Observatory? Is this a close drive for you, a far drive for you? H- how did it feel? 25 minutes. And so it's funny. I live in Florida most of the time. I spend some of my time uh, in New York and, and out here in L.A. a little bit. But I remember one time when I first came here for some work, and uh, my wife asked me how the traffic was, and I literally pulled up the Waze app, and it wasn't one red line. E- everything was red. Mm-hmm. And so how long have you, have you lived here in Los Angeles? Uh, 21 years. Did you ever do radio? Because, dear Lord, did, can you, that voice. Oh, Holly. no, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. No. <laughs> Re- did you do voiceover work? Anything like that ever no, in the past? No, I was an actor. You first. were an actor. Okay, yes. great. Well, you've got a pretty insane voice. If I only had that voice, Holly, imagine the things I could have done if I had Carl's voice. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, no, no sweat, man. Listen, so you grew up, I'm sorry, did you say you grew up here? I grew up on the East Coast. Okay. Uh, so I grew up in Maryland, from D.C., grew yeah. up in Maryland. Then my mom worked for... A.C. Nielsen, which was in Florida. So I grew up in Florida for high school. What part of Florida? Uh, Clearwater. Oh, so uh, that's Dunedin, funny. Dunedin, yeah. Oldsmar. So our offices, the, the main office that I have where my family lives because they refuse to move, is literally in Tampa. We have a house uh, right over across the bridge in St. Pete. So we're in Clearwater all the time. We've got clients all over Clearwater. That's okay. funny. Isn't that a small world when you kind of think about yes, it? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. So you went to school there. Yes. And then uh, what, what took you from there either out to the West Coast? I moved back. We moved back to the East Coast. Okay. And then I went to Chicago for college. Was your mom like, I'm going to get the hell out of Florida. It's too hot here. It, it, this is clear water. This is not, this uh, we is not were, everything I thought it would be. We were in Oldsmar at the time. Yeah. And I think it was just... Um, it's thusly named. I'll just say that. <laughs> Oldsmar is thus... No, nothing wrong with Oldsmar. Right. But uh, yeah. So then you moved? Yeah, we moved back to Washington, D.C. My father worked for the Library of Congress. Um, a lot of my, my grandfather was the U S weather bureau man. So when you called for the weather, he did that. Really? Yeah. So I grew up around politics all my life and I just wanted to go somewhere where I could be creative and perform. And so would you call up to, for the weather just so you could hear your, your, your relative? Yes. I'd take him. Did to you say show that was your, your grandfather? Is that what you said? Yes. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool, man. i show and tell if I wanted oh, that's to so go funny. to Bush Gardens. I'd say, you know, is it going to rain? And so that brought you out here to the West coast. Yes. Uh, great. And so you moved out here, did some acting for a little while, or yes. still do from time to no, time? I did I did for about, uh, I'd say about five years. Then the commercial actor strike happened, and then I went into editorial. I started temping, and I ended up at The Hollywood Reporter. So, Holly, you're still an actor. Do you still do, you still do some acting, Holly? I dabble. I'm a Second City grad. So. You, wow. <laughs> She's a Second City grad. Good. I know you still do some acting because you always act excited when I call you on the phone <laughs> or text you at this point. Now listen. So now I'm surrounded by, I'm surrounded by actors. So that's, that's an interesting trajectory. So, you, so the actor strike almost pushed you into another industry to some extent. It did because I had to figure out something else to do. Um, I didn't want to cross. Of course, I wasn't going to cross any lines. And I figured... Why not go to the Hollywood Reporter? I'd been reading it and Variety for for years, and I think acting was so passive. I just didn't want to be passive anymore. I wanted to be part of something that was happening. So, working at the Hollywood Reporter was like having an aerial view of the whole entire landscape, really industry. Yeah, as opposed to working one day at Paramount or two days at Universal. So, when you were working for the Hollywood Reporter, what were you doing for them? Were you writing for them? Obviously, I'm assuming. And were you writing? I would write as and about town, you know, about okay. town coverage. I did wedding and birth announcements, calendar of events, 
Um, sometimes I would fill in, but mostly I was an editorial business analyst. And then where, how long were you there? I was there for eight years. Oh my gosh, you were there a long time. Yeah. So again, as we think about this industry and all of the changes that are happening in it, I think one thing that I would take away, even just from that early part of your career or part of that story, is sometimes you just have to create adaptability, right? Right. You know, we all want to get into this business, whatever part of this business is, whether it's uh, being a chief marketing officer or a VP of, of global for a brand or or everybody that works underneath them. You know, I, the, the people that listen to this show um, are, they touch the industry to some extent. More so if we're out in LA, people who touch right. the, you know, the entertainment part of it, right? I think a takeaway for me from that story is just that, which is if something happens, if a change happens, and in this case it was a strike, um, how do you provide adaptability around your environment but still be able to be involved in that environment? Right. And, and for me, it was to just learn. And I think that's the second thing. It wasn't like, oh, here's this job that's going to save me. I was an assistant first. By the time that I started getting in the business, it was different. You know, here's Martin Scorsese, but I'm not going before him to audition for Gangs of New York. It's what does he think about film preservation? You know, all the agents that I had prior to that, I let them go, so there was no conflict of interest. I wasn't talking to anyone for a job. And so I just absolutely learned, and then I became an analyst. So I was an assistant for about six months. To that point, though, again, it's the willingness to, I don't say swallow your pride to some extent, right? But to say, look, I've got to put some hustle in this, and I've got to be willing to learn. And if, uh, if I don't, I'm probably not going to be here because there's right. other people who are lining up behind me to say, I- I'll do that, right? Right. I wonder, I feel like sometimes as I talk to, I hate to take millennials and group them mm-hmm. in a giant bucket because I don't think that's mm-hmm. fair to all of them. And I know plenty right. of them that, that work incredibly hard. But there sometimes seems to be, maybe it's because the economy is still going so strongly and unemployment is really low, that there's almost this whole generation that has missed that time where it's, that kind of holy crap moment of like, how am I going to you know, pay my bills and how am I going right. to navigate my way up, right. up this ladder a little bit? Mm-hmm. So you were there for quite a while. And yes. then what took you out of the Hollywood Reporter? There were five different buyouts of that company. And so it became almost like Survivor. It was yeah. a tribal council. And it wasn't really... Almost Jeff Probst is standing there and he's kind of looking at Yeah, he at was you. the only one that was missing. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't even so much cause. It was just the industry was changing. And so by the time, I'd say the fifth, I still have, I have a scar right here from this new takeover company taking our printers out as uh, papers were coming in from Cannes, from TCA, which was the Television Critics Association. Yeah. They were like, each piece of paper costs eight cents, you know, to print. And I'm like, yeah. okay, but we need our budget, you know, we need our stuff. And wrestling almost with a guy. Who, <laughs> you're who, not a guy I'd want to wrestle with. Again, I know this is a podcast. <laughs> if you're watching this on video, you'll, you'll see it. Carl, you don't look like somebody somebody wants to wrestle with. I tried to be very diplomatic. And yeah. then, you know, he stopped and he said, do you know when they turn the Hollywood sign on? I want to take a picture for my wife. And I'm like, oh my God. they don't light it up. <laughs> and you can't take my printer. Not this second, but they did. And yeah. so at that point, when you see kind of the writing on the wall, once again, like you said, it's yeah. like, I have to adapt. So when I got laid off, it was fifth round layoffs. Um, I didn't even know them, you know, so there was nothing personal. I just felt like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something else. And where did that take you? Did that take you into a creative and production? or where That did... took me, believe it or not, to the New York Times. Did um, you I move was... back to New York? No, I stayed here. Okay, great. I was on a non-compete for six months. Okay. Um, so I just absorb content. I just, actually, even though I was at home, I just, it was like I was still working. I stayed on yeah. top of everything. The New York Times owned Baseline Research out here. It was part of their media group. And I interviewed with New York Times and I got hired by Baseline. And then I worked there and became a content producer. And then they got bought out. Yeah. And then it was a startup. And so I'd say really for the last eight years is where I got into the startup world, which is where I was covering Netflix. It started. Facebook as it started. Um, all these new platforms that came in. And all covering content. Yes. And so when you say that you're covering content, are you writing content for them or are you writing articles about what content is being developed? Tell us about that because it almost seems like the position that you've been in is a precursor for what everything is about now, which Mm -hmm. is everything's about content. Right. You seem to be in that er earlier on than many people. I was. And and thank goodness I had the managing editor that hired me yeah. had worked in television. So again, he had had to adapt to. So what we did was we supplied reports to the industry of who's who, who has deals, 
um, who has the television deals, who has these first look deals. And when I got there, the writer's strike was over. So I literally cleared out about 2,000 deals that will never happen again. That's interesting. Because the strike had happened. And yeah. so, you know, with Force Majeure, they were gone. And that was it. So uh, talk to us. Because, again, uh, first of all, thank you for coming on and joining us for the show. We, we usually keep these anywhere from around 15 to 20 yeah. minutes so that we can pull a couple sure. pieces of nugget, you know, nuggets sure. away from it. Uh, we, we like to say that sometimes because that's typically what somebody's uh, drive is. Clearly not if you're in Los Angeles. But um, <laughs> fast forward a little yeah. bit and now... Talk to us just a little bit about not necessarily the work that you're doing for Netflix, but just talk to us about the environment that you're in and the fact that they seem to be such leaders in, in content in, in, in all forms and capacities. So talk to us about the kind of work that you're doing for them, whatever parts of that that you're allowed to kind of talk about. Well, what I'm doing for them is I'm, I'm working in licensed content. And it's prior to that, I was at Warner Brothers. So after baseline research, I went to Warner Brothers. Okay. Um, I was there for a year and a half and putting movies together. Again, adapting. I didn't know how, but from standard def to the language to everything. And then what happened was uh, I was on a contract and my contract wasn't going to be renewed. It had been like 18 months just because the AT&T sale was coming. And so I just wanted to participate. Again, I didn't want to be passive. I started interviewing. I talked to Netflix two days later. I was a contractor and started. They wanted to... They wanted someone who knew what I knew how to do, and I'm glad to join their team, even as a contractor. And so, again, not to ask specifics yeah, no. about about projects that you're working sure. on with Netflix, but tell us a, just a tiny bit more in the in the time that we've got left yeah. about that kind of work. And so, if, if if you're hired there and you're there in essence as a as a content provider or producer or, or, or product creative, what's your day to day look like in essence uh, for them? The, my day-to-day -day work is looking at licensed content that's going to go live all over the world. Okay. And so it's just still learning, but that's what I do. So it's, and it's, licensed content, give me an example of that. So is that like Bird Box has been produced it, and somebody's trying to figure out that no, they that's want to sell a, it? No, that would be an original. So Bird Box is an original, but it would be, say, The Bridge. Okay. Um, or it would be foreign series, or it would be series from the BBC. Gotcha. And then under the guidelines I'm given... Um, you know, just making sure that those are ready to go. Ready to go. When their window opens. Great. And so uh, in that capacity, are you then also navigating uh, the Amazons of the world that might also be looking at some of that content? Or is it more you guys already have the content and you're just trying to figure out where to, they, put, where yeah, to put it the, all? Con everyone has their own yeah. content queue. And yeah. so that's, that's where I'm at. So Amazon and the other companies don't. And so... Way. To put a button on this, if you're if you're in marketing and you're trying to think again about the the, the element of, of content creation yes. and, the, and the importance of that, um, what do you think your advice is to those that are in the industry? It may be different than yeah. how you navigate your right. job, but again, um, clearly owning content or creating right. content is, is everything right. these days, and Netflix has led the right. way. So what's one last piece of advice you feel like you could give to those out there that are trying to figure out how do they either develop their own content right. or, or how do they find it? Adapt. Adapt. Pay attention, understand. Social media is now the new water cooler. They're the ones talking about the Handmaid's Tale, maybe for Hulu, Handmaid's Tale, or they're talking about Bird Box. There's, it's the everyone wants their cue down. You know, everyone's yeah. cue is high. Discovery. People are finding shows they've never seen before, and they're not on a linear schedule. Well, listen, uh, Carl, I promised you this would be painless, right? It was. And um, uh, we appreciate you joining us Thank on you. the show today. Uh, if you want to find out more about uh, Carl, check out his profile on LinkedIn. And you can always find out more about all of our guests on the CMOSuite.com. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you for having appreciate me. Appreciate it. I am super excited. It's been kind of an all Hollywood edition for us. Has it not, Holly? It sure has. Uh, it's like everybody that we talk to has got their hands in the entertainment industry to some extent. And, uh, and no better uh, than my next guest coming up today, uh, Daya Lawrence. Daya is the CMO of Variety. She's responsible for driving Variety's global branding and communication strategy. She oversees strategy, creative communications, ad sales, programming, development. It, it, everything is in there. Am I right, Daya? Well, not quite everything. Oh. I oversee developing the ad sales program. Almost all of it, though. There's a lot going on. You touch Variety. a lot. And obviously, you've got a, a tremendous background. Um, and we want to talk, uh, obviously, a bit more about that. But first of all, again, thanks for joining us on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Now, we talked a, a bit just before we actually started the show. We were talking about iHeart the fact that they've been such yeah. uh, great partners of ours. They allowed us to be able to produce our season one there. 
Uh, you work in the entertainment industry. You know how hard it is to get anybody to talk to you to some extent sometimes, right? Unless you're helping them to promote something. Yeah, and oh, obviously, of course. Everyone's out there promoting something. Variety has definitely been in, in the business of that to some extent. What was interesting for us, uh, Dale, last year was... Um, you know, we had decided to do a podcast. We decided, we felt like there were some good ones in the, in the industry, but we wanted to, to give more CMOs a chance to be able to kind of mm -hmm. talk a little bit more in depth, either about their historical, about what's changing sure. about the marketplace to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, as we would get CMOs to kind of ask us like, well, okay, well, uh, s send us an episode. Last year we didn't have any, but uh, thank God when we produced with iHeart, they produced a hell of a show for us. And so we've been really lucky to have guests like you come out and join us for, uh, for season two. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So talk to me a little bit about uh, some of your background. How did you end up at sure. Variety? Where'd you grow up, uh, uh, if you don't mind me asking that well, first? Well, I grew up in Newington, Connecticut, which okay. is outside of Hartford, which yeah. pretty much everyone that I Nearly everyone I went to high school with went into the insurance industry. And because many of my relatives, well, that's, you know, Harford yeah. is the insurance capital of the world. It used to actually be the head of journalism and uh, publishing, and that's why Mark Twain lived in Oh, that's Harford. interesting. Yeah. And then everybody got out of publishing and it, decided to go into insurance. Well, then uh, it into moved insurance. to New York, and it, yes, yeah. they all decided to get into yeah. insurance so they could make money. There you go, exactly, <laughs> yes. And, and somehow you ended up in Variety. And I had to know, <laughs> there not you go. in insurance. I, my, Somebody my, had to do my it. My dream when I was a kid was, like, got to get out of Newington, Connecticut. Yeah, so. that's so funny. So yeah. what brought you out of Connecticut? How well, did you end up escaping from Connecticut to so some extent? So I do have to attribute... Um, all, uh, some of my professional growth to Newington because yeah. they had a fabulous children's theater there when I was a child. Okay. And I was in this company and I developed as an actor and I went to a, a performing arts high school part of the time while I was going to Newington High. And then I majored in theater and I was a professional actor for many years. Out there in Connecticut? It, in New York City okay. and in Los Angeles. Yeah. But uh, mostly in New York City. I toured with a Broadway show. I starred in several off-Broadway shows. I did regional theater. You know, you scratch yeah. anybody out here and they're all actors. It's Everybody's all underneath an actor. There. You were an actor. I was you? in the day, uh, back oh, in the day. Oh, how did I know you were an actor? I was a game show actor. host for Nickelodeon. That's where Holly and I met. <laughs> yes, we were actors together. I actually don't know that anybody who's ever listened to this podcast, I've never actually said that, but yeah, that's where we met. I was a game show host for Nickelodeon <laughs> yeah. back in the Every, day. Everybody in, in Los Angeles is either an actor, they used to be an actor, or yeah. they were a writer, or they were a singer, and I can usually tell the singers right away by the way their voice I'm definitely not one of those. Yeah. Although people in my office might question that because I sing everything that comes yeah. on. If you know Ariana Grande, please <laughs> throw, throw her my number. You probably know her. You're in Variety for crying out loud. <laughs> Daya, help me out here. We know everyone, but I don't know that they know me personally. Well, there you go. That's fair enough. So, um, so, so you were in acting. So I was in yeah. acting, and um, I had come out here, and I had always sold on the side. I was always very entrepreneurial. Okay. I sold ads in high school. I was the... Really? I was the editor of the newspaper and because I like to have money. So because Do you have a Toomey bag, by the way? I'm I do have two Toomey oh, bags. Good. My friend but Charlie I can always Colby use used. another one. Okay, fair enough. Charlie, <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm you pitched you that very well. Yeah, Thanks. Charlie. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I, I was on his podcast one time. How many people do I have to buy bags for, for crying out loud? <laughs> so when I was, uh, I, I got my real estate license and I was the head of sales at a very successful building in Manhattan. So when I came to Los Angeles, I, I got a job working uh, part-time with a publication called the Hollywood Creative Directory, which um, I really didn't like this job, but a friend of, the person that ran it was a director and he put me in his movie and so I got work yeah. out of it and it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. I always say that sometimes you can't see your luck until later. And that sometimes the things that you think are not good that are happening to you turn out to be very, very good. So let's stay on that for one second before you finish that, because I, I think that's one of the important points that we try to take out of any of these podcasts, mm -hmm. right? What's one good nugget that somebody can take out of this? Somebody maybe who's like, well, I'm not in the entertainment industry, so how does this help me? But to your point, sometimes you don't know the luck. You don't know your unless, luck. Unless, you know, in, until it's happened, yes. right? And so you should always, no matter what you do in marketing, whether you're a chief marketing officer, a VP of, of marketing, a global, right. a local, whatever it is, there is a bit of luck, but you have to look it in the face and kind of take that opportunity when yeah. it comes and not be maybe too proud to take it to some extent. No, I agree. And I also think sometimes, you know, when, you, when you're starting out in your career, I'm seeing this in, in one of my nephews now, you have this idea of what your career path is going to be and you don't want to get off that path. Because you think, I, I was always like, I'm an actor, I'm an actor. And I had all these opportunities. I, I was always a good salesperson to, to go into real estate and really develop that career because people had noticed how, you know, I was pretty good at it. And I was like, oh, no, no, I'm going to go be Gwendolyn in The Importance of Being Earnest. And, you know, if I had perhaps looked at that lock 
that I could have had a whole other career in real estate. But I was very stubborn about what I was going yeah. to do. You have so. something that you call the grow where you are planted strategy. Yes. And so tell me, what is that and how does that play into, right. into where you are today? So, for example, when I was at the Hollywood Creative Directory, one lucky thing in this grow where your planet strategy was that uh, I remember when we all gathered around this you know, computer and we were looking at the World Wide Web and no one understood yeah. what is a website, what is, and I seized that opportunity. I, that was something I did well yeah. <laughs> was I was like oh this looks like it could be something everyone else is kind of afraid of it I'm going with this yeah. and I really developed it, learning digital and uh, wh wherever I went uh, after I went the Hollywood Career Directory was sold to a company called iFilm and then Variety was sort of struggling and I cold called them and they didn't really know what to do with digital and yeah. I had a digital background in it time when not many people did. So when I went to Variety the first time, this is my second time at Variety, I saw that this is where, you know, the world's obviously going it's in this there, direction. Yeah. And they were still holding on to print, holding on to print, and yeah. they didn't really want to focus on this. So I focused on it, and I was still an actor. So my strategy was always, I'm going to be as good as I possibly can be, so that you need me so much sure. that when I get an audition, and I have to go shoot ER... You're saying you can't leave. That's you're going to let me say. go. Yeah. You're going to let me go shoot it and come back. You're going to let me do whatever I want. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, that was really what motivated me. Yeah. I have to be so smart, so, so valuable good that I can get flexibility in the I navigation of it. Flexibility. Right. Uh, to go back to the web for just a second, it's funny. Again, uh, I probably don't look this old, Holly. You actually probably know how old I, I am. But it, of course, is amazing that my kids have no concept of that. I remember only because we're talking to you and you're the CMO for Variety. And again, we appreciate you coming out and being on the show. Uh, I, I was so naive that I bought the URL movieplaces.com. I owned that URL for a long time. And I was calling movie studios to see if they would actually just provide me all of their uh, movie clips. Uh, that I could put on this movieplaces.com and get movie theaters to, to put their show times on there. Not, oh, Nobody like, would do it. No, right. They're like, they're they're not who give are it to you? you? I'm not you? giving you right. that. We're building our own, right? That's right. Of course, you know, now you have Netflix. And of course, and then I was like, well, I guess I just should <laughs> let this URL go, right? I bet if it's for sale. Actually, I got. Did, did you it, sell it? No, I didn't even know <gasps> what to do with it. Oh, no. I don't know. It, it, yep. who, Lord only but knows who, who has it now. Right. I, I'm, afraid to, I'm afraid to even type in the URL at this point. So. Uh, so you you've been you came to Variety once. I came to Variety yeah. and I developed their digital yeah. sales. Yeah. And then what happened was, uh, I again I got lucky in that that you know people needed people like yeah. that. And then recruiters were calling me all the time, and I was very happy at Variety. But then I saw that Variety's business was not quite going in that direction. So I took this job running the Western region for Point Roll, which is a rich media company. Yep. And I stayed there for five years. It was an amazing job. Uh, I mean, we, we killed it. And we, I really learned a whole 360 in digital because we worked with creative agencies and ad agencies. Yeah. And, and so as a CMO today, that's, yes. that's the key, right? The key is you've got to understand. It, to, to me, I was explaining this to somebody the other day. The funnel has literally been completely turned upside down. It used to be that uh, a CEO was looking for somebody who really understood brand, and that's still important, but that was like the most important thing was to understand brand. And then if you understood PPC or SEO or whatever or social, that was kind of in the bottom part, but now it seems like it's turned itself upside oh, down. I, I Everybody's got agree. a direct-to-consumer strategy. You better understand search or social. You better understand what programmatic is right. or behavioral, contextual, and brand is still important, but it's, it's almost like it's the bottom part now yeah. at this point. And so being able to be at point roll for a little while allowed you to be able to, again, just have that additional insight or that understanding. Great insight. Investing into, into that part of it. Absolutely. And we were creating technology strategies, yeah. tech strategies for companies like Ford. Yeah. We created, we were the first out of the gate with a, a creative dynamic optimization strategy. And so I understood all this. Then I wanted to work in mobile because I saw that was really important. So I went to AT&T. And then uh, from AT&T, programmatic was on the rise yeah. with video. I went to Tube Mogul. And then oh, I went okay. to, a, yeah. yeah, I was at Tube Mogul. Yeah. I went through their IPO. And then Congratulations. 
I guess. I don't know. Did you get some stock? I'm not allowed to I did to have some stock, Good. but sometimes, you know, those things are, they seem greater than what they are. And sometimes an opportunity like a point roll yeah. is greater. Uh, <laughs> right. Not to not to sidetrack, but we've used, one of the companies that we invest in is a digital company called Uconnect. They're in the programmatic and biddable media space. We traded on the trade desk for probably eight years. And then they all came to us. They were like, hey, we're going to go public. And a couple of the guys were like, I might buy some stock. I was like, uh, you know what? I, the market just, I, it scares the hell out of me. Of course, now I could only wish that I had, had bought some stock. Right, well, it. if they give you stock, that's different. Yeah, that's true. That's a very yeah, good point. I, I, yeah, yeah, so you so. ended up back at Variety, and was it because... And then I, I went to a startup in Silicon Valley, and then Variety kept calling me because Variety went back. through, well, they went through a big change. Yeah. You know, Variety has gone through enormous change. All publishers, really, to some extent, have, yes. or are they better? Yes, they point. have to, or they're not going to survive. So what happened was Variety went through this period where because they made this decision not to be focused on digital, which was really detrimental yeah. to them, they came very close to going out of business. They were owned by Reed Business Information, and it's not a secret that the fabulous, wonderful Jay Penske came in and saved Variety. Penske Media saved Variety, and he helped create new strategies, brought in better talent, you know, Made some adjustments. Did you work there when he no, bought it up? Okay. No, I was at, I was, I can't remember where I was when, I think I was yeah. at AT&T when he bought it. And so then he, uh, they kept trying to get me to come back because they decided that let's go find some of the people sure. th that we that really liked stuff. Yeah, and bring them back. So uh, Michelle Sabrino Stearns, who is the publisher of Variety, mm -hmm. said, listen, you know, we've got this opportunity, would you want to go back and work in marketing? Yeah. And it just happened to coincide at a time where I was like, I would really like to go back and work in marketing. Yeah. I'd like to make this shift, because I had, I had worked, I've worked on both sides. Yeah. And um, she said, why don't you come be our CMO? And I was like, I'm in. You hit on a couple of things, if you don't mind us talking for a little bit longer than I told you that we might. You talked about Jay Penske. And so how has he been as, a, as an executive? How involved is he in, in Variety at this He's a fabulous yeah. executive. He's he's kind, warm. Uh, he's such a f wonderful, wonderful person, and he's a visionary. And I'll tell you what he did that was so brilliant. One of the many, many brilliant things he's done is w where some of our competitors were. Then you know when you're when you're in publishing, you've got to constantly be reinventing yourself, yeah. and you've got to stay on the forefront of trends. So whereas some of our competitors decided, let's try and be this blended consumer, B2B, we'll do more consumer, we'll go into lifestyle, we'll do fashion. We stuck to our original business model from 1905, this. Which, which is we are the trade business news. We are authoritative business news. That is what we do. Nobody does it better than Variety. And that really sticking to that strategy has really made a huge difference. And when we, t when we talk to people in the industry all the time, they tell us that, you know, you're the serious publication, you're the publication. So, and that has helped us tremendously. It's helped us get better market share. It's helped us, it's helped us Everything. grow our business. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I can't live without Variety Insight. I'll just say I'm a producer. Oh, and Variety Insight. Yes. Yeah. It's oh, I'll very, tell Mark Hobick that Very you said helpful that. and important. <laughs> yeah. So, Daya, if I can, let me ask uh, one more question as we wrap uh, this episode. And again, thank you so much for, sure. for not only uh, joining us on the show, for, but for actually coming out here. That's, uh, we know that's a hard ask sometimes. Not only will you be a guest on a show, but will you come to us, right? What's one kind of, uh, of last piece of advice that you would give to other CMOs that are out there that maybe aren't, aren't working for a company that has been as progressive to some extent as Variety has allowed you to be? Maybe they're working for a company, again, that still is putting their head in the sand to some yeah. extent, and they just can't, they can't get ahead of themselves sometimes because they're so stuck in legacy. Mm. Oh, I know. That's the hardest What advice part. can you give them? Well, I think being a change agent, getting people to go along on the journey of change because people naturally don't want to change. If you want to find out more about Daya Lawrence, you can, uh, of course, check out her profile on LinkedIn. That's probably where I stalked her first. Um, and you can uh, visit us, of course, on the CMOSuite.com to find out more about her as well as this episode itself. Thank you for joining us, Holly, on this episode of the show. Thanks for hanging out in the CMO Suite. The podcast for marketers who want to be in the know. Presented by Connectivity Holdings. You're a C-level manager. You shouldn't have to know the difference between behavioral or contextual targeting. But your agency should. Uconnects provides brands and biddable teams direct access to platforms like the Trade Desk, Google, 
Amazon, Facebook, OTT, and more. Their U.S.-based traders can train your in-house team or provide complete transparency with no minimums and CPM-based service pricing for true transparency, something Mighty Hive, The Trade Desk, and Centro simply don't offer. Tired of being the smartest one in the room? Reach out to Uconnex today for a free demo. Uconnex, the world's leader in true, transparent, biddable media. Hey, it is Sean Halter, host of the CMO Suite, and I am reminding you it's the podcast for marketers who want to be in the know. So make sure that you look for the CMO Suite on iTunes, on Spotify, on YouTube, or just type in the CMO Suite.com.